Okay. Uh, first one, one logistic detail. I messed up on the, the due time of the problem set six. I forgot to shift it from what the, whatever time I was turning on the problem set to one o'clock. So I caught at least half a dozen of you guys uh, trying to finish. If, if you got caught or blocked from finishing the problem set in the last hour and a half, write me an email and I'll, I'll fix it. I apologize. It just, I thought I was being so careful. It's like, oh well. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, we finish up talking about fluids, now, the world of balloons floating, water flow through pipes, air going past balls and airplanes. Are there any lingering questions or issues that you have that I should talk about before really walking away from it? Anything? Okay. So where we're going to head now is into the world of heat. Uh, thermal temperature, thermal energy, heat, uh, starting sort of simple, and we will then drift into what is known as the, the, the world of thermodynamics, which is heat on the move. Um, finally, it's, hopefully you'll find it's not that hard. It, it, it's one of these names, oh, thermodynamics, oh, it must be complicated. But, you know, it's, it is what it is. And um, hopefully it'll be understandable and useful to you. Certainly, certainly the movement of heat is useful and, and uh, something worth knowing about. So the context in which we'll start is, is wood stoves. And so just basically a, a, the, the, the simplest of, of heating devices that are sort of realistic to put inside your house. Yeah, you could have a campfire in your, in your living room, but it's not very sensible. And you can have a fireplace. And wood stove is kind of a fancy version of a fireplace. So that's where we'll head. And as my opening question in this is, is hopefully you all you know, have a sense for what a wood stove is like. Uh, they typically come, in, you know, some of them come in various colors, but, but uh, a lot of them are just black. And an alternative to black, if you really, <laughs> yeah, if you like bling, uh, go for a shiny gold wood stove. And the question here is just which would heat your room better? A black wood stove or a shiny gold plated one? You can, solid gold uh, alternatively if you're really wealthy. Okay, how many think that a black wood stove is the best choice? How many think? A shiny gold wood stove would be the better choice. How about both of them are equally efficient? Okay, well, I'm getting a uh, majority are voting for a black wood stove by, by a substantial margin. It's substantial enough that I'll tell you, yeah, it's the best choice. And for an interesting reason, uh, they will both get hot. They'll both burn your hands if you touch them. They'll both have hot air rising off them, which we'll, we'll, we'll deal with all that. Where they differ is in their ability to, to emit thermal radiation, which is sort of a mysterious and largely invisible thing that comes off of hot surfaces. And the black wood stove will be very good at emitting that thermal radiation. The shiny gold-plated one will be uh, singularly bad at doing it. Choosing gold is sort of the best, worst choice. Uh, it's terrible emitting thermal radiation. And uh, you're, you're used to sort of standing near a campfire or a fireplace and just feeling that, that heat flow at you in a mysterious, invisible way, which is actually thermal radiation. Uh, you would feel that off of a black wood stove. You will not feel it significantly off of a gold one. It's just like you're just looking at it, nothing. Um, so that's, that's part of the story. OK. so. Some observations about wood stoves. They burn wood inside an enclosed firebox, which is, which is a useful difference between them and open fires. You have the, the burned gases are sort of contained, and you can do something with them in a strategic way so you don't have to breathe them. Um, they often have long chimney pipes. That's partly because you want to go from the wood stove to the real chimney or out, the, out of the house. But actually, the, the chimney pipe serves a purpose. It's part of the heating process. There, there's a lot of heat in the, in the gases going, I should say, there's a lot of thermal energy in the gases. We'll see, we'll see the distinction between heat and thermal energy in the, shortly. Uh, and you might as well tap into that before you send the stuff out into the great outdoors. Um, their surfaces are usually dark in color. 
for, for good reason. Uh, associated with the dark color is there is an ability to, to emit thermal radiation well. They'll burn you if you touch them. To, so, so obviously you don't really don't want to, you don't want to touch them and you got to be careful who's around them. Uh, heat rises off their surface, which is, in, uses physics we already know, hot air, hot air balloons and stuff like that. That's part of how heat is conveyed around your house is that is the same buoyant force effects that affect hot air balloons. And they warm you when you stand near them and that's referring in my, my mind largely to the thermal ra radiation they emit. You're not touching them, you're not above them feeling the rising hot air. You're just standing near them and you're feeling something come at you and that something is thermal radiation. So the questions, my, my, my smorgasbord of questions to go through, the first of which is what is thermal energy and heat? Um, so first off, you know, thermal energy itself, so, so okay, so thermal energy is the, is the physical quantity. It's, it's, a, it's a, a part of energy, it's a type of energy a, or a category of energy. And heat is thermal energy on the move. It's, it's, it's thermal energy being transferred. And this is sort of a, you know, it's a, it's, it's a convention and a, and a, and a uh, it, it, it's for the purists and, and the people who want to be legally correct in everything. You don't, something doesn't contain heat any more than it contains work. Work is energy being transferred from one thing to another. So energy is the conserved quantity. Work is the mechanical means for transferring it. In, the same, in that same way of thinking, thermal energy is the part of, of overall energy that's associated with temperature and stuff. It's what you've got. You've got thermal energy. When you transfer it, you transfer it not by work, which is the mechanical means for transferring energy. You transfer it by heat, which is the thermal means for transferring energy. So, so we have a second means for transferring energy. I, up until this point, I've talked always about work being the way to transfer energy. It turns out you can also transfer energy by, by heat. They are not completely unrelated. They're not like random things. I, I, the, the transfer of, of, of thermal energy as heat involves lots of little tiny pieces of work being done. And so just as thermal energy is ordinary energy chopped up into biddies, heat is work chopped up into biddies too. It, so. Uh, it's, not, it's not all that new. But anyway, so heat is energy on the move be, because of, of, in fact, differences in temperature. Uh, we'll see in, initially that heat always flows from hot objects to cold objects. It goes from hotter to colder. Never goes the other way for statistical reasons. It's just in, incredibly unlikely for it to go the wrong way. So it flows from hot to cold uh, because of a difference in temperature. And we'll, we'll start to get into the more details about about why heat flows that way and, and what you can do about it if you really don't like that when we start dealing with thermodynamics. Uh, uh, for example, air conditioners move heat the wrong way. They make your room colder and colder by moving heat out of your room air into the great outdoors. And that's not the way heat likes to go. It likes to go from hot outdoor air into your cold and beautifully air conditioned room you're moving it the wrong way with that air conditioner. How does that air conditioner pull off its, its trick? So we'll, we'll get there. But right now, we'll just go with the simple world of, of when you got a hot object, heat goes out of the hot object into the colder objects nearby. Any questions about my ramble? Okay. So job one, wood stove. So, you, so, so to follow the wood stove's activities, first thing it does is it creates thermal energy and then eventually it distributes it around the, around the room. How does it create thermal energy? And the way it does that is by, it starts with a form of ordered energy, energy that's, a, by ordered again, that's energy that can, that can do work directly, that, that's, that has the ability to do work. Uh, thermal energy does not have the ability to do work directly. Uh, so chemical energy, you, you're starting with wood, something like wood, and air, which contains oxygen, and you're causing a chemical reaction to occur between the two. And that chemical reaction turns what started as chemical potential energy into thermal energy. And um, it's not making energy out of, out of nowhere, which is obviously uh, 
impossible. I've claimed that all along. You can't make energy from nothing. You got to start with it if you're going to end with it. Uh, so it starts with, with molecules in the wood and in the air and rearranges them. And I'll come in and you know, I'm looking in my, to, to, to see my, the order of things. I'll, I'll come back in a minute to, to, the, to how that rearrangement works uh, and how it releases chemical potential energy. Uh, just more general views is you, you start with, with chemicals that are essentially the reactants, the, 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 things you, the things you're going to cause a chemical reaction to occur in and you eventually turn them into product molecules. And that, that, I'm, that's just naming things, so I don't care about it. But you start with a certain assortment of molecules, and you end with another assortment of molecules. And my claim is that they have less chemical potential energy and now more thermal energy after the reaction. OK? So this is just a, a brief, di not even digression, a, a, a brief exploration of, of chemistry and chemical reactions without any detail, you know, mi minimal details, just to give you an idea of, of where is chemical potential energy and, and how do you release it. And if you look at atoms, so presumably you've all over the years learned about atoms and molecules a little bit and so on and, 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 and some ideas about chemistry. When atoms, atoms are, are these structures that are consist of a, a a brief review here of, of the world of atoms, They're, they have a little positive nucleus, positively charged. This is the world of, elect of electric charges and stuff, which is not part of this semester. It's part of the other semester. But nonetheless, they have a little positively charged nucleus at their center, and they have electrons around that nucleus. Electrons are much less massive. Uh, they're light little fluffy guys. You can think of them, or people do, think of them as orbiting the nuclei because not because of gravity, but because of, of the forces between electric charges. That's rather an oversimplification of the world of atoms, but it's, it's decent. We can live with it. The, ba the basic idea is that there are electrons on the outside, this tiny, tiny little positively charged nugget at the center. And these structures by themselves are stable, and they'll, you put them off in empty space, and they'll sit there as long as you like. If you take two atoms, any two atoms, it doesn't matter whether they're helium or cobalt or uranium or whatever. You take any two atoms, as you bring them from great distance, slightly closer together, they begin to notice each other. Uh, what they do is, is they rearrange in a very subtle manner their electric charges, their electrons and their, primarily their electrons, so as to be a little more uh, attractive to one another. They, they manage to rearrange their charges just enough to cause a very weak attractive force between them. So they, they, they begin to pull toward each other. And of course, the forces appear in Newton's third law pairs. So this atom pulls on that atom and vice versa. All right? So all atoms attract one another subtly at, at, at distance. You know, how much distance? They got to be, a, to, 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 in principle, for, for any distance. In practice, the, the forces only become sort of noticeable when they are some number of times their own size apart, so like 10 times their size apart, not a billion times. You would never, in principle, they're attracting, but in practice, it's so weak. Who would notice? Once they start getting within, like, my hands distance of each other, they're, they're starting to pull together. Okay? They pull, and the pull gets stronger and stronger as they get closer. They, they begin to rearrange more and more, trying to attract each other, until they reach a, a distance in which their attraction is the strongest. And then, oddly, as they begin to get closer still, that attraction gets weaker. They're starting to overlap a little bit, and they're no longer so, so driven to be, to be closer. There actually comes a point in which they stop attracting altogether, and they are at equilibrium. No, they exert no net force on each other. There's a favorite distance. And if they get closer still, they start to repel each other. And the repulsion kicks up s strongly as they, get, as they really seriously begin to overlap. All right? So long and short of it is, the atoms attract at distance. They reach maximum attraction. The attraction begins to fade. And then it becomes repulsion. And 
they would love to sit forever at the equilibrium distance. That, that's the point at which they need to repel or attract, they'll just sit there. So let's imagine assembling the, the reactant molecules, the molecules in, in wood, and the, or the molecules that are oxygen in the air. Oxygen is a diatomic molecule, meaning it's two oxygen atoms. Uh, the oxygen atoms start as individual atoms in, in concept, at least, and they come closer, they attract, they attract, they attract, then they start not attracting as much, then they reach nothing. Let's imagine assembling an oxygen molecule with tweezers. So I'm going to grab the two oxygens with my tweezers at great distance, and as they pull toward each other, I'm going to fight it. I'm going to, to, make them, to push them apart, so they're going to have to drag me along. They're doing work on me as, like a, as I bring these two oxygen atoms together. If you, if you take two dogs that are determined to, to go and run around each other, whatever, you grab both dogs and you have to, you have to hold them apart. Ah! They're going to do work on you as they go together, right? You're, they're giving you energy. Same with the, with, the, with the two atoms. They're giving you energy and you push them apart, push them apart, push them apart, and then they finally reach equilibrium. And you let go and you walk away. They will have done work on you as they came together to stick, and you walk away with their energy. They now have given up energy. They don't have enough energy to separate anymore. For them to go apart, you would have to grab them with the tweezers again and pull them and do work on them now, pulling them apart. So the two oxygen atoms are, are, are stuck by, by virtue of having given up chemical potential energy to, to you, the tweezer person. And that's the nature of a chemical bond. That's the, that's, well, that's, the, that's, the, that's the big picture view of a chemical bond. You've heard about chemical bonds your whole life. What's a chemical bond? It's an energy deficit associated with the energy that was released during the process of bringing the atoms or the structures together and, and bring them to equilibrium. That, so there's a chemical bond. Chemical bonds are, individually, they're, they're tiny. The amount of energy involved in each of them is, is tiny, but collectively, in a, given the, how many oxygen atoms, for example, there are in this room, it's a lot of energy. To take apart all the oxygen atoms, sorry, oxygen molecules in this room would require a, a heroic amount of energy. Um, so some bonds are stronger than others. The bonds between, for example, two oxygen atoms are quite strong. On the other hand, the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, if given the opportunity to are stronger still, so they're, so different different bonds uh, have different amounts of energy deficit associated with them. You okay with the idea that, it, that the, the bond is an energy deficit and why it's there? Is that okay? All right. So you got oxygen. You assembled oxygen at, uh, atoms together to make molecules. Once you once you created a molecule, an oxygen molecule. Uh, another atom barely sticks. You can stick another atom to it. It, it does, it's, it's not so appealing. And, and the, force, the, the subsequent, chemical, chemi uh, subsequent bonds are so much weaker that we, for the most part, they're not part of the story on, on, uh, for the air in this room. Most of the oxygen molecules are just perfectly happy to be oxygen molecules at, at room temperature. If you go cold enough, you can have them start to stick to each other. And you get liquid oxygen, for example. All right, same with the molecules that make up wood. Wood is primarily a chemical known as cellulose. It's actually a polymer chemical, meaning that it's assembled out of lots of little uh, structures that repeat over and over and over and over again to create giant molecules, molecules that are almost big enough to see under a microscope. Um, so they're, they're gigantic molecules. Uh, those are the molecules that make up Plastics, rubbers, um, cellulose is a plastic. It is the most common plastic by far in the world. Uh, it's the plastic that is all the, all the cell wall structures of all the plants. They're all cellulose, this polymer. Uh, so cotton is almost pure cellulose. Uh, trees are largely cellulose and so on. It's, so it's a, it's a big molecule built of these polymer, the little structures in the polymer, so this is, this is just random knowledge that you ought to know. Cellulose is built out of the little structures. They are sugars, lots of little sugars all tacked onto each other. 
The other polymer that's in your common experience, built out of sugars, is starch. Starch, again, is little sugar molecules tacked one onto the next by, by way of chemical bonds between them and so on. Uh, a key difference between starch and cellulose is we can digest starch. We, can, we, can, we have the enzymes in us that cut those little molecules apart, and then they become sugars that we can digest. We do not have the enzymes to do that with cellulose. So you eat, you eat cellulose. You know, this is cellulose, by and large. You know, of course, it, it, it goes right through you. It's, we call it fiber. Um, we can't digest it. Evidently, even cows can't digest cellulose directly. They don't have the right enzymes, but they have in their gut uh, microorganisms that do have the right enzymes. So the chewing their cud and all that stuff that the cows do, they're, they're taking advantage of the microorganisms dicing up the sugars in the, in the cellulose molecules of, of fodder, whatever the, the cow ate. So that's the story of, of, of cellulose and starch a little bit. Any questions about those, things you wonder about? Okay, so wood is mostly cellulose, some, some other odds and ends. Uh, and the sugars, so basically you can sort of think of it as sugar. Sugar's assembled out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen molecules assembled in the right structural orders and so on. And in each case, t tacking on the various pieces, release a little bit of chemical potential energy. And so you get this whole structure that holds together by virtue of yet another uh, chemical deficit of energy of chemical potential energy. So you've got oxygen around, you've got these sugar stuff around. The big issue then is, what if you rearrange the, the, the structures? You, you take the, the oxygen molecules, the two oxygens, you pull them apart, and now you've got some building blocks to play with, and you take the cellulose molecules and you pull them apart into all their constituent atoms, carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, and now you rearrange them. And you rearrange them with, toward what? You rearrange them toward two very strongly bound molecules, carbon dioxide and water. So you put oxygens on all the carbons, two, two oxygens a piece, and you make carbon dioxide. You know, carbon dioxide, it's just CO2. You know, it's, um, and uh, what do you do with hydrogens? You stick them on oxygen as well. You put two hydrogens on every oxygen, and you end up with H2O. When you do that, that assembly process releases more chemical potential energy than, than sort of anything before. Wow. The result is that the energy that it, let's see, so, so, so suppose you start with the, with the cellulose and the oxygen molecules. To, to take them apart, in principle, takes a whole lot of energy because you have to pay back all the deficits associated with all the chemical bonds. And then you reassemble them into water and carbon dioxide. In which, during which they release energy to you. They give you back energy as the chemical bonds form. So there's a, there's a, there's a, a pay it up front to take them apart, and then there's a payback as they reassemble. It turns out the payback is bigger than the cost up front to, to disassemble the original chemicals. There's a net release of chemical potential energy in the, in the transformation of the original materials, wood and, and air, oxygen, into these final materials water and carbon dioxide. That's, I mean, that's burning. Burning, burning, it's taking advantage, in, well, specifically in this case, for burning wood. It's taking advantage of the, that, that the product molecules have stronger chemical uh, bonds than the reactant molecules that you started with by a significant amount. So a lot of chemical potential energy is released in converting the Product, uh, the, the reactants into the products. Just issues with this or things? Hopefully that's, that, that's clear. Uh, so you're making the conversion from one material to the other and in the process creating a bigger chemical potential energy debt. It, it would take more energy to disassemble the final material. Uh, where to go with this then? Ah, okay, so, so having said that, in the process of burning something, the full story that I, that, I, that I talked about in concept doesn't quite occur. You don't literally disassemble the, all the oxygen molecules into oxygen atoms and all the uh, 
cellulose molecules into the constituent atoms, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, you don't fully disassemble them. You, you basically, they, they disassemble only as much as, as is necessary for them to then rearrange and, and, and plop back into the final, their final form as, as carbon dioxide and water, and hopefully not too much other stuff, that, although other stuff does does form uh, by accident and statistics. You don't, you don't get perfection every time you do these rearrangements. You get some stuff that wasn't intended because it happens, because you're rolling the dice an awful lot of times, and once in a while you get snake eyes. Uh, what happens, so, so you, get, you get partial disassembly and then rearrangement and then, uh, then final assembly. Even that partial rearrangement takes an investment of energy up front. In order for the, for, you, Oxygen molecules are pretty, are pretty happy and stable by themselves. So is cellulose, pretty happy and stable by itself. This table doesn't just spontaneously convert along with the, the room in, room's air into oxygen, uh, into water and carbon dioxide. Why not? It's because it, it requires an initial investment of energy to start the rearrangement. That initial investment of energy is just called generically activation energy. It's, it's the sort of the minimum threshold energy needed to start the chemical rearrangements, carry them far enough along the path that, that they then sort of rush downhill into the final form. It's like, it is, I mean, the, over the hill, it's, it's a lot like, you, like trying to cross a hill. Suppose you've got a bowling ball in a, a, a shallow valley, and there's a, a valley down the road that is much deeper, and if the bowling ball were able to get there, it would have much less gravitational potential energy. This is as opposed to chemical potential energy, but the analogy holds. If the bowling ball can get over to that low valley, great, it will release lots of gravitational potential energy. But you have to invest some energy to roll it up the hill, dividing the two valleys, before it can roll downhill into the final valley. And the same thing happens for the molecules uh, trying to rearrange. You have to invest the energy to take them out of the, the shallow valley that is the, the wood and the, and the oxygen to kick them up across the divide and allow them to roll downhill into the carbon dioxide and water that, that is a much better form for them, but that they cannot find without, without you helping them get started. So that's why you've got to light a match and, and, and heat the chemicals to get them started in their reaction. Um, so the, lots of things around us are, are, can potentially undergo rearrangements. You've got to invest first. So keeping heat away from things is, always, is typically a good idea unless you want the rearrangement to start happening. Okay? So that's the story of what's happening inside the firebox of the, of the wood stove. You put in chemicals that, are, have, that, that have excess chemical potential energy that they can release if you light them on fire. So you provide the activation energy to get them started. Once, they, once they're started, they often will, will uh, help each other cross the barriers and, and go from, one, from their original uh, arrangement of molecules to the final one. So the, the, the fire is self-sustaining in most cases. All right. And I could light matches and stuff, and you've seen that so many times yourself, you know, you know the story. Um, so this is just a, a question about the, the, the idea of burning. It, the original molecules, cellulose and oxygen, have uh, some large fraction of their energy in the form of chemical potential energy and the absence of much thermal energy there at room temperature. After you light them on fire and burn them, they still have exactly the same amount of energy they had before. It's just in different forms. They have now have less chemical potential energy and more thermal energy, they're at a higher temperature. Why don't they go backwards? Why doesn't burning, un, you know, why don't you unburn stuff easily? Why, why, all the energy's still there. Why can't you go from carbon dioxide water back to, to wood and oxygen? You okay with the question? So I'll ask it. Uh, unburning wouldn't conserve energy. How many think that's the case? How many think that unburning would violate the laws of motion. Newton's laws, first law, second law. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah. Okay, how about unburning is statistically unlikely? Yeah, it, in fact, it is the last one. It's a statistical unlikeliness. Um, 
all the energy is still there. When you burn something, you know, seal the room, insulate it, and all that stuff, all the energy that was present in the room before you started the burning is still present in the room after you started the burning. So are all the atoms. Uh, for, for all practical purposes, they are conserved quantity in, in, in everyday life. It's not true of nuclear reactions and stuff. Um, the laws of motion don't, don't have any, uh, they're willing to let things unburn. It's just, you know, you can, you can have the things go backwards. They, they just, they follow the laws of motion. If you're watching a movie backwards, all the laws of motion are, are upheld. But you start seeing weird things when you watch a movie going backwards. You watch somebody slip on a banana peel and turn gravitational potential energy and other things into thermal energy and stuff as they hit the floor. They don't unslip. If you watch a person on a banana peel shoot back up and to, to standing, it's, it looks funny. Why? Because you never see it actually happen in real life. Because it involves a statistically v unlikely uh, thing of turning thermal energy whoosh, back into gravitational potential energy. Never happens. Same with unburning. Statistically unlikely. It just, too, it's, it's too rare a thing to ever happen, and you never see it happen. All right? And that will eventually t be, be something we'll deal with in, the, in looking at, at uh, the laws of thermodynamics. OK. This brings us to the sort of the, the meat of this section, which is having created all this thermal energy by turning lovely ordered chemical potential energy directly into thermal energy, how do we distribute it around the room? And first off, it wants to flow from, from uh, the wood stove into the room because the wood stove is the hottest thing in the room. And heat flows spontaneously from hot objects to cold objects. That is its favorite direction of flowing for the same sorts of statistical reasons that prevent unburning from happening. So heat naturally goes from hot to cold. Um, there is an, another type of equilibrium worth noting at this point, which is called thermal equilibrium. Up until now, I think, I think I've talked only about mechanical equilibrium which is when you experience zero net force. Thermal equilibrium is when no heat flows. So uh, many of the objects up here, th this piece of this long stick and the table are at thermal equilibrium, meaning no heat flows from the table to the stick or the stick to the table. They are happy as clams. So no thermal energy goes between them as heat. Uh, that, it turns out, is associated with them having the same temperature. You know, what, is, what does temperature even mean? Temperature measures how much thermal energy is present in, a, in an object. And, and actually, to, 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 to deal with the fact that a bigger object naturally has more thermal energy than a smaller object, you, know, you divide by something. So it's the thermal energy per unit. What's the unit? The unit, it turns out to be uh, a little fuzzy what, what it means. It, it's sort of per particle, and what, par what, what a particle is is a little messy, because the particles that live inside objects are not just the atoms, they're, uh, in some cases, they're the electrons in the material, and so on. But if you, if you look at an object's assortment of, of particles that can be involved in thermal energy, and you divide the average kinetic energy that's Th the average thermal kinetic energy of, the, of those particles, um, you, you divide the total thermal kinetic energy by the number of particles. That gives you the average thermal energy per part, thermal kinetic energy per particle. That's directly associated with temperature. Um, so, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll come back in part to this, uh, this idea of what is, what is temperature. But the main point to realize is the more thermal energy you have rattling around in, a, uh, in, a, in an object, given the same object, the more, the, the higher the temperature you have. And there is really a direct relationship between that thermal energy and the particle. Why is it the kinetic energy and not the potential energy and, and, and is a little complicated. I should say, why is it, what does it mean when you, when you limit the energy to thermal energy? The thermal energy in, a, in, a, in an object, my, my laser pointer here, does not include 
the parts of the object's energy that can do work. For example, if I throw the laser pointer acro across the room, it clearly has a, a, a substantial amount of kinetic energy that could be used to do work. That doesn't count. It didn't get hotter because I threw it. The, 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 the energy that's associated with the entire object is just useless. Or, or lift it higher, it's got more gravitational potential energy. That doesn't count. It can do work with that. It's only the energy that's uh, chopped up and diced, spread around between the particles. That, that's not work equivalent. You can't do work with that. That's thermal. OK? So um, this is just talking about why it's nice to have a box around the fire. You don't have to breathe the, 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 the chemical products of the reaction. I'm going to set that aside. Most of that's obvious. You, you could figure, figure it out without any trouble. What I, want to do what I want to concentrate on before the whole hour blasts by is the ways in which heat flows from the hottest object in the room, namely the, the wood stove, to everybody else, to everything else. And you've bumped into these, surely, in, in K through 12 or elsewhere, uh, the three famous mechanisms of heat transfer. But I want to try to, to uh, flesh them out more carefully than hopefully you've, well, than, than you've probably seen them before. Conduction, convection, and radiation. Surely those are not uh, completely foreign words to you. Conduction is the flow of heat through materials. That is, if, if I hold this stick, that end of the stick, on or in the, the wood stove, I put it in the wood stove, and assume it's, don't, don't let, let's, let's let it not burn. That's gonna be, that end of the stick is going to be hot. The, the end of the stick that I'm holding is going to be cold. Heat is going to work its way through the wood stove, through the stick, uh, in, by various mechanisms to get to my hand. So heat will flow from the hot end of the stick to the cold end of the stick without any movement of the stick itself. It'll sit here looking like normal, but heat will be flowing through it, and that mechanism is known as conduction. Convection. Convection is the movement of heat with a fluid itself, so be, being carried by a fluid, for example, air or water. So if you, if you heat air, if I make a blob of hot air here, and somehow this, this air manages to, to move its way over to this computer monitor, it's going to transfer heat from maybe we heated this air in the wood stove, and now it's touched the, the monitor and transferring heat. That's convection. It's a weird direction for convection, but it's convection. Okay, so, so heat moving with the fluids moving. And the third mechanism, the one that's, that is potentially mysterious, is heat moving from a hot, the hottest object around to the coldest object, to colder objects, by way of electromagnetic waves, which is the broad uh, concept in which familiar uh, phenomena uh, are special cases, light, in ultraviolet light, infrared light, um, radio waves, microwaves, gamma, <laughs> gamma rays, and x-rays. Those are all electromagnetic waves. They're all the same phenomena, uh, distinguished only by the details, so, namely wavelengths and frequencies. But otherwise, they're the same phenomena. And those can carry, th those electromagnetic waves can carry thermal, can carry heat from hot to cold. And that's the world of radiation. So I, I'll flush it out as we go. So far, so good? OK. About conduction. Uh, conduction occurs primarily by two mechanisms within a material. So this is, this is heat flowing through a material uh, without the material itself moving, uh, m moving noticeably, I should say. And heat flows through materials by a two path pathways. One is just the jostling of adjacent atoms and molecules. As at the hot end, where there's a lot of thermal energy per particle, that being what, what it means to be hot, there's a lot of motion in, among the little particles. At the cold end, since it's cold, it has less thermal kinetic energy per particle. So there's less motion here. And if you just have a lot of motion in the mole atoms and molecules at one end and, and little at the other, there's a statistical tendency for these guys to jostle their neighbors, which in turn jostle their neighbors, which in turn jostle their neighbors, all involving lots of little bits of work back and forth. Push on it, and it moves in the direction of the push. That's work. 
push on it, it moves opposite direction, it's pushed, that's negative work, and so on. It works its way through the system. And I, I describe this as, as bucket brigade uh, movement of heat. It goes from atom to atom, the same way in the old days, way back when, you'd fight fires by taking water and passing buckets from one person to the next. You're kind of passing thermal energy from one atom to the next, to the next, to the next. And so, so that mechanism conveys heat through something like a, a, a stick. That, that is the way in which heat goes through this piece of wood. If I heat that end and, and keep this end cold, heat's going to come at me. And it's going to be a very long wait before I notice much. There's a, there's a faster way for heat to flow. And that involves the electrons that are uh, in some materials. Some materials have electrons that can move long distances between atoms. We know those materials as metals. Metals carry electricity, to some extent at least, because they have mobile electrons, electrons that aren't forced to cling into certain atoms or to certain chemical bonds. They can actually go long distances through the metal before they do anything. And they can pick up energy. In a, in a, in a metal rod, you've got this molecular motion that's associated with uh, being hot. You've got a lot of thermal energy here. They can, they can give ener energy, can be picked up by an electron here. Boom, it's got a lot of uh, energy. And it skips all the intermediate atoms and molecules. It travels 100 or 1,000 molecules over, and it transfers its energy to, to an atom or molecule way down the chain. So it's bypassing the bucket brigade and just going, taking a, a, a huge leap across. And this is why metals are much better conductors of heat than insulators. Insulators are things that, that don't have the mobile electrons. Um, the primary carriers of heat in metals are the electrons. That, and the more mobile those electrons are, the better the metal is as an electrical conductor, and the better it is as a thermal conductor. So finally, before I blast through the whole hour again, I'm pro you know, activation energy, chemical reaction started. OK, so we've got a burner here. And the burner is heating a central hub on a three-spoked system with hanging metal balls on it. And they're hanging from putty that will melt when it gets above a certain temperature. Those metal spokes are made of three different metals, copper, aluminum, and stainless steel. Of these three, the best conductor of electricity is copper. You may, may have noticed that a lot of uh, household wiring is made of copper because it's a great conductor of electricity. It's it's second to silver. I don't know where gold fits in, but, but silver and gold are really good conductors, too. Uh, silver, obviously, they're both expensive, right? Copper's not cheap, either, but copper's at least, you know, you can afford it. Silver wiring is for the, like, audio files and stuff. Um, aluminum just lost it, its first marble. Um, what's happening is heat is flowing from the hottest thing in this story, which is the central hub, out these three, the, these three bars. And the three bars carry heat with different abilities. Copper is the best, so copper just lost one of its marbles. Uh, so aluminum is second, but not by much. Aluminum is pretty good, too. So a lot of the electrical wiring, uh, for example, the, the, high, the power lines that run, the, 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 many of the power lines that, that run outside your house are aluminum, because it's so much cheaper than copper. They, they use aluminum. Uh, to save money. Uh, it's also lighter. So copper and aluminum are pretty good. Uh, aluminum just lost its second marble. Copper should win this race. Actually, it skipped the second marble and dropped its third marble. Alumin copper should win the race. Aluminum should be a reasonably close second. Stainless steel, you'll notice, is terrible. Stainless steel is a terrible conductor. Well, it's, it's, a, it's not a good conductor of either electricity or thermal energy or heat. Uh, it's, for, for good reason, it's, it's an alloy made of a bunch of things to be chemically kind of inert. Why, you know, why is it stainless? It doesn't react with things. It's a mixture, usually, of, of iron, uh, chromium, and nickel. And the disorder that comes with having all those three atoms all mixed together makes it hard for electrons to travel long distances through it. 
they, they hit all the, the mishmash that comes with having a mixture of, of, of stuff in there. It's not smooth and clean sailing. So stainless steel is, is a crummy conductor of thermal energy and the crummy conductor of electrical energy. You, you don't use it for wiring. It's terrible. And in cookware, it's not so great either as the carrier of heat. It's lovely to, for, for the, as a cooking surface. It keeps your food clean and neat and not, you don't get rust or whatever in your food. But to help it conduct heat, you often want to make a, a composite cook pot out of, for example, stainless steel covered aluminum. A lot of good pots have aluminum, an aluminum core with stainless steel on the outside, or copper core with stainless steel on the outside. Good conductors of heat to, to, to move the heat around nicely, but a chemically inert, thin layer of stainless. Um, stainless is such a poor conductor of heat, you can do things like this. So this is a pipe of stainless steel. And that means that I, you know, so copper and aluminum simultaneously lost the last marble and, and stainless steel just doesn't care. So I can heat this, hopefully you can see it, it's red hot, and I'm holding this. I don't even notice anything's happened. If this were copper or aluminum, I would be burning my fingers. If it were solid copper or aluminum, I would not even be holding it like, I, I, Two seconds after I stuck it in the flame, I would be burning my fingers. So terrible conductor of heat. Um, in, uh, yeah, that's good enough. What I want to do before we stop here is any excuse for liquid nitrogen is a good excuse. The usual rule applies. So we'll finish up with this. With no nest, just because. Now this is the coldest thing in the room. I've shown you that when, you, when something's the hottest thing in the room, heat flows from hot to cold. That also happens, I'll stop this, stainless steel will never do anything. This is the coldest thing in the room. I can make heat flow from anything in this room into it, and interesting things happen. For example, this is a bell made out of lead. It, bells are not made out of lead normally. Why? Because lead is too soft. When you smack it with a, the clapper, the lead just goes thunk. It just dents, and nothing happens. But if you cool the lead cold enough by, by putting it into contact, this is now cooling by, condu by conduction. Uh, I'm now cooling the lead from room temperature down to about a quarter of room temperature on an absolute scale. <sighs> Things happen within the, within the lead that prevent it from from doing, from being able to dent. It loses its ability to, to uh, rearrange the, the, the crystal and structure. Lead, like most metals, is a, crisp, is a crystalline material. You, you're familiar with quartz crystals being these beautiful, uh, carefully shaped structures. Most materials you encounter are crystals also. Me the metals are, are almost entirely crystalline materials. You don't notice the crystals just because they're all smoothed off, and you, you can't see the transition from one crystal to another. We've now cooled the crystals of lead to the point where they can't dent anymore. They're rigid and stiff, and so now you've got a, a lead bell that rings. The great trick in making bell metals up until modern day, the modern era was making metals that were stiff enough that they couldn't dent. They, could, could only, they, they were elastic and bounced. And it was very tricky to make such metals back then. That's why things like the Liberty Bell, was a, was a, these are heroic efforts to make that big a piece of, of a special metal that, that had this capacity to, to be hit and to, to deform, but not to permanently take the new dented shape. And you know, you know it cracked. Um, those, those, those rigid metals, which we can make, for example, from a penny. If I hit a penny with a hammer, a normal penny with a hammer, Inside pennies are not copper anymore. They're almost entirely zinc with a copper coating to save money. If you hit a normal penny with a hammer, it just dents, right? You make, you make a big flat mush penny. It's boring. I won't even show you. But if I freeze the penny, well, freeze it. If I cool it so that, like the, like the lead bell, it's no longer able to dent properly. Uh, I don't want to hit the lead bell with a hammer, but it would shatter. Um, then we have to make a whole new lead bell. I can hit a penny. And all, all I can worry about is the feds coming and arresting me for damaging currency. OK, so I've cooled the penny to the point where 
can, can you see the, the, the fragments of penny? I mean, I've got a way. I could have zoomed in on this. I'll zoom in one, one bit, sorry. We'll do it. Come on, come on. Okay. They're the penny fragments. I'll freeze a penny. One more, and then I'm going to freeze a, a rubber ball. And then we'll be done. Okay. Freeze a penny, freeze a penny. If you've got to go, you've got to go. Okay. Freeze a penny. Okay. Last thing rubber ball. Woo! Freeze rubber ball. Putting things that are already brittle hard into this into liquid nitrogen are boring because they just get cold and brittle hard. But you put things that were nice and soft and could dent or could bounce uh, in, into liquid nitrogen are fun because they become fragile. They become brittle hard, and then you can do things like I'm about to do. All right. It's now it sounds a little different, right? I want to make sure it's nice and cold. All right. Oh. <laughs> Try to do this in a history class. Ha ha. I don't get enough control with the gloves. I got to do it barehanded. There you go. All right. <laughs>